Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and um, welcome to the fourth conversation in our third COVID-19 conversation series. And um, we've called this conversation series Recovery and Regeneration in the Face of Overlapping Crises. I'm Claire Betker, and I am the Scientific Director of the National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health. And I'm just trying to get my slides to move here. There we are. And I will be the host for today's uh, conversation, this fourth conversation in our third series. The National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health is located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, Mi'kma'ki is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship with the Mi'kmaq and the Wallace to, sorry, Wallace to Quick people signed with the British Crown in 1725. And those treaties do not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, and they recognize the Mi'kmaq and the Wallace to Quick title and establish the rules for what is an ongoing relationship between nations. I'm joining you from Treaty 1 territory, which is the original land of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota and the Dene people, and the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation, now known as Winnipeg, Manitoba. The National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health is one of six collaborating centres that have been in place since post-SARS, so around 15, 16 years now. We are knowledge translation centres located uh, across Canada and funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Our site, our centre, the National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health is focused on the structural and social determinants of health and health inequities. And we're hosted by St. Evax University in Anaganish, Nova Scotia. And I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, my team, our team at the National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health for all of their hard work uh, in supporting this uh, series of conversations. And in particular to Midian Richard and Tia Mata for their leadership and support, but also to other members of the National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health team that you're going to meet um, throughout uh, this session. So what's our intention? Our intention in these three series, so we're in uh, conversation number 14 actually, across two years of conversations, is to create a space where we can connect, where we can reflect, where we can share, and where we can start to, I'm gonna go backwards, um, where we can start to um, create a space for collective healing and collective recovery. And we hope that together we can start to envision an equity-informed recovery and regeneration and what the public health or community health are, roles are to support that. In this particular series, we have explored listening, we've explored leading, last time we expo explored power and power balance, power imbalance, and today we're going to talk about courage. And we really want to hear from you during these sessions. So if you could use the chat box function um, right now or start right now and throughout the session. First of all, to introduce yourself, maybe locate or situate yourself um, where you are, where you're coming from. And please feel free to comment, to provide feedback or most importantly, questions for our panelists. And we hope that you can join us at, after one hour. So in about 55 minutes from now, we'll go into small groups and have small group discussion for about 20 minutes. And in the last um, three conversations, those conversations within that small group have been very important and very interesting and I think helpful to each other. So we encourage you and invite you to come uh, into those small group sessions with us at the top of the hour in the breakout rooms. I'd like to remind you that there is the opportunity um, for a choice of language, uh, French or English. Um, and if you look at the bottom of your screen under the interpreter icon, you can click there 
and choose which uh, language you'd like to listen and which language you would like to participate in. So a quick reminder um, before we get going is that this is the fourth of five conversations in this series. And the next one is in a couple of weeks on June uh, the 22nd, and it's about hope. And uh, just as we were getting uh, going uh, this morning, um, in my mind, courage and hope are really uh, closely aligned with each other. So we're really thinking that today's conversation will lead really nicely into uh, our next conversation on June 22nd, focusing on hope. So we hope that you'll join us. If you want to watch past sessions, um, if you were unable to join us then, you can check out our YouTube channel um, and find recordings of those sessions. And if you want to reach us, here's how to reach us. You can reach us through nccdh at sanivax.ca or um, to any one of us um, uh, here at the, at the center. So today in our discussion, we're going to be looking at discovering courage. Um, and we have three really uh, exciting uh, panel members with us here today. And I'm gonna ask them in just a moment to introduce themselves. But um, how we framed, and this is with your input, with what you've told us in the previous conversations in the chat box, but also upon registration, that you'd really like to talk about or have discussions about what does courageous action uh, look like? What does it look like right now? What are some of those bold, brave actions that we can to that we can take to defend all beings? And I think those were your words, Shannon, as we were getting ready a few weeks ago for this session. And how do we think about or um, expand, I think, our thinking, but also our conversations and, and most importantly, our action around uh, being courageously persistent and courageously resilient in this time of incredible uh, change, transformation, and um, also, uh, as we said in the in the face of sort of compounding or multiple crises coming at us. And I think Shannon said she had to leave today to go uh, quickly to a session on, or a meeting around um, uh, heat and, uh, you know, perhaps the, the impending high temperatures that are gonna be coming our way in the next few weeks and months. So um, in, what we'd like to do right now is I'd like to move and um, introduce or ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed. Then I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Catherine Baxter to introduce herself and then Dr. Shannon Waters. So just a bit of an introduction and um, where you are right now and situate yourself. And while we're doing that, I'm gonna encourage folks in the chat box to continue to introduce themselves. And if they have any questions or thoughts about how you might like uh, this conversation to go. So starting with you, Gaynor, please. Thanks, Claire. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, or maybe good morning, depending on uh, which part of Turtle Island you're in. So I'm Gaynor Watson Creed. I am a public health and preventive medicine specialist physician by training, and at one time did hold the post of medical officer of health for the city of Halifax or the Chibuktuk region of Mi'kmaq out here on the east coast of Turtle Island. Um, I then moved into the position of Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province of Nova Scotia. And I left that position last year and I'm now an assistant professor at the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie University and an associate dean in the Faculty of Medicine. Very happy to be here and uh, very happy to support this conversation with the NCC on discovering courage. Thanks, Gaynor. Kathy? Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Kathy Baxter and I'm an assistant professor at Brandon University. And Brandon University has campuses on both Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 territories. Uh, the main campus for Brandon is located um, on Treaty 2 territory, which is the traditional shared land between the Dakota and Ojibwe. And um, I am uh, currently, my areas of, of teaching uh, focus on community health, 
Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this conversation today um, and looking at the concept of, of courage and how we move forward. Thanks, Kathy. And I've known you and Gaynor for a very long time, and you are uh, absolutely women of courage. So really looking forward to your, your contributions. And Shannon. Hi, Nate. Yes. Good morning, everyone. It's the beginning of my day where I'm at. I know for others of you, you are a way through your day, but I just want to acknowledge it's a really great way to start a day of work having an important conversation such as this. I am joining you guys today from my own traditional territory, the village site of Nates, which is also known as Maple Bay on Vancouver Island. And I am a public health and preventative medicine physician who has the honor, privilege, and challenge of uh, working within my own home territory as a medical health officer. And uh, yeah, over the last number of years, I at times wondered why on earth did I ever think I wanted to do this type of work, but I've uh, been very much um, reminded throughout that process of the resilience of, of the people I come from and the teams that I work with. So happy to talk more about that with people here this morning. Thanks, Shannon. And uh, I uh, called the other two women of courage and, um, as you face that challenge, um, there is uh, the opportunity for that uh, courage there. I started my career in public health in the home community that I uh, lived in. And uh, I learned an enormous amount from that com community. And I actually credit that community for not only my success in my career, but in my marriage and in my family. So um, uh, it was a distinct privilege to work uh, in the community in which I lived. Okay, so we're going to ask us the panel a few questions and I'm going to encourage folks in that chat box to pose questions and to give some comments. Uh, Tia uh, Mate, uh, one of our staff is going to watch that chat box and help me with some of that questions to make sure that we have that conversation and that interaction with the audience. And welcome and thank you everybody for coming today. So I'm going to start with just a big broad question in terms of why is courage, why do you think courage is important for equity driven recovery and generation regeneration uh, in June of 2022? And I'm going to start with the East Coast and move my way again across the country. So Gaynor, uh, to you first, why do you think courage is important for equity driven recovery and regeneration? Oh, it is such a big question, Claire. Um, I think I would I would start um, with first an acknowledgement. You know, we are here today, many of us, because we are public health practitioners kind of through and through, and we live and breathe, I think, in many ways, equity and courage every day. And so there's a part of me that goes, um, I think courage is needed, and I'll come to that in a moment, but I... I I don't think we need new courage in public health. We've always been courageous. We've always been at those tables defending the right to have the conversations about structural determinants of health that extend beyond healthcare systems, for example, um, those types of things. So, so I think courage is needed, but I don't think it's necessarily new courage. It's maybe that we redirect the courage that we've always had coming forward. And the reason I think it will be more important to answer your question directly um, is that what I see coming at us in the next three, five, 10, 15, 20 years is increasing complexity of public health challenges for communities, not decreasing. So if I think about where we've been, for example, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and all the complexity that, um, that that entailed, I think a few things have stood out that are gonna challenge our courage as public health going forward. One of those things is that um, in some ways our identity around public health was challenged by this, uh, by this pandemic and the response to it, which was an all of society response. But um, there's something that we have done as public health, I think over many decades that is both laudable and also a little bit of an Achilles heel for us that we will we'll need to reconcile, which is as we have been growing the conversation about structural determinants of health, we have also been um, 
you know, sort of inviting many, many uh, parts of society to engage in that conversation with us. And there's a way in which we said public health is everybody's responsibility. And, and I think some of what we saw play out during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was that that also leaves an impression that it's nobody's specific responsibility. And that um, anybody, uh, everybody should be involved in, in uh, sort of solving public health issues, which means that uh, no particular skills are needed. And so I think we will actually have to have the courage going forward to defend our unique space as public health practitioners going forward and defend the science and rigor behind our public health approaches that actually make them successful in ways that I don't think we we, we imagined we would need to do uh, prior to COVID-19. So I think that's one aspect of courage that will be needed. Uh, I think the other thing is that as we go forward, particularly looking at equity, um, equity-driven approaches, we will have to have the courage to admit some of our own shortcomings in that respect as, as public health um, in order to come to a new place. And so when I think even again about the COVID-19 response and the ways in which we saw inequities play out during that, I also think about the ways in which as public health, we were maybe inadvertently complicit in uh, supporting those inequities to play out. And I think that's good to, you know, sort of turning the mirror on ourselves is gonna uh, require some courage for us as well. So, so I think that's an important um, aspect. And I, and I think another aspect, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at this maybe related to, um, you know, sort of defending our, our space is that we'll need to have the courage to say no to the things that betray um, the approach and betray us as public health practitioners uh, going forward as well. And I think that's um, that's that's difficult too. Just a, a tiny anecdote to speak to the complexity that I started with. You know, today I was in a conversation about equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, which is one of my major portfolios at Dalhousie University. And we were having a conversation about the pushback that we were seeing because real change is happening in our faculty um, right now. And so it's fantastic to see the change, but as many of you who have been involved in change initiatives know, when you see the change, you also see the resistance to the change. It comes up pretty quick alongside it. And um, some of you know what we discussed there is having the courage to keep going. Uh, and so as I think about the complexity that's facing us as public health and those new challenges that are on our horizon, we will hear from all of the factions you know, in, and around the world because our communications are globally connected that will challenge us on our right to continue to defend um, against uh, structurally determined inequities. And we're gonna have to have the courage to stand up to that increasingly hostile um, bullying as we get into the complexity. So maybe a little bit of a, a sort of a random set of offerings, but that's what I would uh, say in response to your question around why is it important for us to pay attention to this. Yeah, thanks, um, Gaynor, and you've given us a, a really broad sort of uh, platform upon which to ground our conversations. So, so thanks for that. I'm going to go to Kathy for your sort of response to that first question, which is a huge question: Why is courage important for equity-driven recovery and regeneration? And so, from your place, Kathy, um, how might you answer that? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. And I'm going to answer, um, I think, from uh, the perspective of actual moral courage. Um, so recently involved in a project that looked at moral distress amongst community health nurses across the country during the pandemic. And we found incredibly high levels of moral distress, 82% of them uh, uh, reported distress in 90 percent um, said it was more than before the pandemic. So it was a very distressing time. But within that moral distress, when we read the stories, there was incredible acts of courage. Um, to uh, to uh, add to what you said, I think uh, it is evident that uh, practitioners have used um, moral courage and exercised courage throughout. Um, so I just would like to, to focus on a couple of those stories at this point. and how um, it might help move us forward into the next step. 
So moral courage is really that ability to act on your values and principles when you face obstacles, when you have to overcome barriers, or where there may be consequences to you personally or professionally. And a few of these stories, they're not happy ending stories. Um, they didn't, you know, the nurse didn't speak up and everything was good. Uh, the nurse spoke up and often nothing changed. But it's in that speaking up, it's in highlighting those inequities, it's in um, speaking on behalf of um, individuals um, and in support of individuals that, uh, that we can help move things forward. So a few um, attributes to moral courage um, and stories associated with it. So one was personal risk. Um, it's hard to risk your reputation or to speak up, express your feelings um, to leadership or people in power. And yet we saw continuously uh, that nurses did that. So many conversations about immunization clinics, about the eligibility criteria and how to ensure that if an 80 year old came with an 81 year old um, and the 81 year old was eligible for a vaccine, but the 80 uh, year old wasn't because of criteria, um, how they spoke up and advocated for their clients, sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully really being able to speak up and advocate for unsafe practices. So we saw, uh, certainly with the immunization clinics, we saw a lot of um, a business model um, being attached. We saw contract uh, workers coming in and many uh, community health nurses were very um, active and uh, communicated concerns about client safety or if protocols weren't being followed, um, really advocating for um, the principles around immunizations and why it's important to have professionals um, in, those, in those roles and those places. Um, we saw incredible commitment and perseverance, um, and we saw lots of moral integrity um, and examples. Uh, knowing their own values, committing um, uh, and committed to act on those values, even if there were consequences. And um, we uh, spoke to nurses who had been engaged with the one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals being asked to self-isolate, um, being asked to stay home, um, and they were the ones trying to help them find groceries, uh, help them to get food in place, um, help them to uh, cope when they didn't have any sick benefits. And so um, how they did workarounds, really, to make sure that people got the support and the resources that they needed. Um, true presence. So even in those very short conversations that nurses had, trying to build relationships, trying to make sure they uh, were asking the right questions, um, that took courage because they had very heavy workloads um, and they had a lot of work to do, but making sure that they preserved those relationships and those um, and commitments to that excellence and care. And finally, advocacy, um, you know, speaking up at the time, but also we saw how they hoped to be able to speak up in the future, um, to be able to address specific inequities, to try and build systems um, that will focus more on, um, on a more equitable approach moving forward. So throughout the pandemic, we saw lots of acts of courage. I think moving forward, why is it important? Um, we need to see it at, at, at all levels. We need to see it at the individual practitioner level. We need to see courage in organizational policies and protocols and having the courage to act on what's right uh, and what uh, will reflect the true needs of the population. Um, and we need to see it at a policy level. We need courageous policymakers um, who will act on perhaps um, unpopular but necessary policies moving forward. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks for lifting the voices of, I think there were more than 200 nurses who answered that survey, right? How many were there? There were 245 nurses, um, and uh, 
just to situate, um, it was a long survey um, and it was right just at the very end of the third wave of COVID. So they were all exhausted and we had over 60 pages of qualitative data. So they took an incredible amount of time um, to try and uh, express their concerns. That took uh, time, energy, and certainly courage um, to speak up and advocate for what they, what they believed in. Thanks. And I think the complementarity to what you said, um, Gaynor, you know, from a, a you know, little higher level view there and out to the, out to the future uh, uh, just really resonates with me. And uh, just, Kathy, just the way you are in the world, how you lift their voices is so respectful. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Okay, Shannon, um, why do you think, from your perspective, uh, the other side of uh, our, our country, why is courage important for equity-driven recovery and regeneration from your perspective, your space? I think courage is one of the forces of energy that keeps us going um, in, in the work <clears throat> of public health and in you know, all the the natural systems and cycles of the world. And uh, like all those natural systems and cycles, it has ebbs and flows. So I think I'll, I'll speak a little bit to uh, a time throughout the pandemic when my courage was ebbing. Um, and uh, so I'm here working in my home territory. I'm Hulk meet them from Stamanus First Nation on Vancouver Island and have a lot of family ties to couch and tribes as well. Cowichan being the largest First Nations uh, community in BC. And we had fared fairly well throughout the first uh, couple of waves of, of um, the pandemic. We had very few cases, but it was always kind of waiting for like, when is, when is the penny going to drop? You know, they think, you know this, this can't keep going on like this, you know, forever. And um, at the beginning of 2021, uh, we started having our first cases and it did not take long before we had a very uh, critical situation in our community. And, and I can speak to this because Cowichan Tribes was quite uh, public, uh, vocal about what we were dealing with in our community. And at a certain point at one night, I had, you know, multiple family members very ill in hospital, uh, schools closed, daycares closed. Essentially, the chief had put a shelter in place and I just you know, was so stressed and just wondering like, oh my goodness, you know, how, 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 do we, how do we get through this time? Like, what can I do? What am I gonna do when I get up in the morning? And I really sat back and thought about and suddenly just felt the, you know, the strength of the people who've come before me, my ancestors, you know, the women, the men, the people of community that have seen very difficult things, particularly in the not too distant past, communicable diseases basically ravage you know, the community, this place where, where I'm living. And I, I, I felt that strength and also realized that in the time that I'm in, I had tools that my ancestors didn't have. Uh, teams of people sitting around a table, a public health system that, you know, exists in a different way than it did back then, like lab surveillance built on trust. We were able to get information on what was going on with cases in our communities because people trusted to give the information to us, to gift the information to us, knowing that maybe we would do something with that to help us collectively. Also, right around that time, like vaccines were just around the corner. We were able to use some of the surveillance data we had to bring vaccines within days into community once we knew that uh, we were having cases, particularly in our elders. And really, like, having that experience made me realize like, you know, that these things, these basis of where, you know, this energy for courage is, is, is a long standing. It's, you know, for generations on generations. And I can, we can tap into that collectively whenever we want to, because we're going to have those natural ebbs and flows of how we're, you know, how we're feeling, where we're at, how much courage we have to uh, bring in. Really, it's all about those relationships. I was so grateful for all the different people from all different, you know, levels of um, uh, within the system and, and areas of expertise. 
and really that it was the relationships, even though we had all the tools, it was still the relationships that are really stemmed from the time of my ancestors that really, you know, brought the strength and courage for us to move on. And also within that perspective, within those relationships is the relationships, not just with other humans, but with, you know, the place that we live in. So I, I have the honor, privilege and challenge of working in my home territory. I view my role in helping to protect health, not just for humans, but for the plants, the animals, the water, the, you know, the land, and really in, in looking to promote that equity between all the beings that really will help us forge new ways and conversations about how to really deal with something like an imbalance of a pandemic in the future. So, yeah, so those are some of the things that I think of when, when my courage is ebbing on certain days to just really tap into, just really tap into the people, the strength, the conversations, the, the teachings that have come before and that have been around for generations on generations. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Shannon. And thanks for what I found many, many different reminders of that uh, wholeness, if you will, of, uh, of where we're at and how we, uh, how we understand courage. So I'm going to ask you, each of you, um, if you want to respond to each other. And then I'm going to ask the people who are here with us in attendance if they've got questions or if they'd like to ask Shannon Gaynor or Kathy to deepen um, some of their thoughts around courage. Uh, Kathy Gaynor, do you want to respond to what you heard? And just take your mic off and I'll acknowledge you. Kathy. Yes, so uh, thank you um, to both Gaynor and to Shannon. Um, I guess, uh, Gaynor, I think the, the piece that I'd like to respond to you because I think it's, um, it takes courage to say it and it takes courage to act on it. But I think it's that ability to look at what went well and what we, uh, what we need to improve on. And I, I do think that that was certainly one of the struggles um, that nurses experienced throughout the pandemic was um, the, um, the struggle between um, protecting public health and those individual relationships with individuals living in situations of marginalization. And so I think to have the courage to say we did this well and the courage to say this is something maybe we want to, to look at differently moving forward will be a really important uh, element uh, in that conversation. And Shannon, just uh, that reminder that we're never alone, that we're acting with the support of, of uh, past generations and those around us, I think is, is a really important thing, um, looking at, at courage going forward. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kathy, for that. Uh, I might also sort of uh, build from where Shannon uh, was first, and, and then uh, Kathy, I, I want to respond to something you said as well, but I'm really uh, struck by your notion of um, caring for and protecting all beings as part of the way forward, Shannon, because I think that's actually, not only is it critically important, but it speaks to the complexity I think that I was referencing earlier. So there's a way in which I would hope that coming out of this pandemic, we have a, a clearer than ever understanding that these are not discrete entities, but actually fully related. You know, our relationships with each other, our relationships with animals uh, and insects on this planet and relationships with the planet itself, then that if we don't tend to all three, then all three suffer. And so I really appreciate you bringing that to the attention of this group in the way that you did, because I feel like in particular, um, planetary health, uh, you know, climate change as the next uh, big public health disaster, and I really think it is the next, I think it's here, um, is going to require our attention around the intersections of those things and the complexity inherent in that in a way that I, I don't I don't think we fully grasped grasped yet and I think we need to so so thank you for that um, I was also really struck uh, Kathy by your comments on moral moral courage and what it takes to display that and thinking back uh, to the nursing teams that I've had the privilege of working with who do who display that in. Uh, in spades and, and also the other public health practitioners that I've worked with who display that in, in spades. And in particular, it's sort of your attention to noting that that 
display of courage often comes at some personal risk, I think is a really important one. Um, and so when I think about even the conversations that I now almost daily have around equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility and recognizing that that, um, that opportunity, for example, for bystander betrayal, right? Where you see what's happening, you know the right thing to do, but you're afraid of that personal risk, taking that personal risk. Um, that opportunity is always there. And so I really appreciated your sort of um, uh, call to uh, sort of take the courageous stand that needs to be taken, even as you acknowledge that there was some personal risk there. I think that's true for a number of public health issues. So thank you for bringing that up. Shanna, do you wanna to respond to, to Gaynor and to Kathy? Sure, and I've heard that it's apparently difficult to hear me, so sorry for that. I'll try and be a little bit closer here. Hopefully this is better. Um, yeah, I just, I'm just i just always struck by like what the different gifts are we bring to uh, you know the collective work we're trying to do together. So I think at times I can feel overwhelmed that I, you know, I, I some, some things come more naturally to me and other things, you know, I, I have to, to work a lot harder at. And then, you know, when you come around a circle and working with people in the team and you're like, oh, I realize, you know, I don't have to do it all. Like I bring my piece, I bring my gift. And then other people have, have other gifts and it complements each other and, and coming towards, you know, our ways of working together. And um, so I just want to really reflect that in, in, in listening to both you, Gainer and Kathy this morning, because I, I, yeah, I just, I just have so um, uh, appreciated hearing your experience and perspectives. And like Gainer, when you, you know, really when you started off saying like public health has always been courageous. And yeah, I think, I think about, you know, a lot of us in public health have really, you know, have a very strong impetus for why we've been brought to this work in the first place. And really, I think, you know, in, in, that, in that work, like, what, what do we do? How, how do we find? How do we support? How do we give people reasons to be healthy in the first place? Which is really such a fundamental question of health and well-being. And it's, it's complex. It's not easy. Sometimes it's, you know, more steps back than it is forward. And I think just so really, like, you know, highlighting that we, this has always been a, a courageous field and that we're you know, surrounded by a cadre of people who, who emulate that at, at ebbs and flows in different times, but that that's really, you know, kind of a common basis of this type of work. So, so thank you for that. And um, Kathy, just in you, uh, you know, sharing the voices of, you know, the nurses taking the time during this, you know, difficult period to, to do this type of work and you reflecting on how much feedback uh, the nurses ha have had given and how important, like even though we, we might be completely tapped out, that to really look at our reasons, our motivations, our feelings behind what we're doing, like that that's still there and to take that voice and amplify it to be able to, you know, give some feedback, some influence, some reflection on what where we've been and where we're going. I just so... Uh, greatly appreciate that I know throughout my training when I got to learn more about you know the qualitative or the you know words that we can bring into our work it just really resonated with my um, indigenous ways of knowing of valuing of story and word and experience along with the numbers so I just really appreciate you bringing that forward because I think as human beings we're, we're like in some ways I've already forgotten you know you know how hard or what I felt in some of those days, and that's a good thing in some ways, but to really be able to capture that while we were going through it, I think is very important to give witness to what we experience collectively and uh, allow that to help shape what we, how we work in the future. So I just raise my hands to both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon, uh, Gaynor, and, and Kathy. So I'm going to encourage, uh, again, the folks in the, in the audience to pose questions to Kathy, to Gaynor, to, to Shannon. 
But um, I'm wondering, we, we talk about courage and we talk about uh, courageous action. We talk about courageous leadership. Um, and we heard about that at multiple different levels from the three of you. But I'm wondering um, if you could maybe, if you've got some other stories or some other um, examples of where, and Shannon, I think it's really important, really interesting where you said you've already started to forget some of those things, right? That that sort of feeling. So this is an opportunity to kind of lift some of those stories of courageous leadership or courageous action. So I'm wondering if each one of you could maybe think of an example where you saw courageous action, saw courageous leadership, and maybe reflect on what you thought contributed to that. What were those sort of uh, circumstances that were around that story that uh, contributed to that action? Yeah, I can start off. Um, oh, thanks, Shannon. Thanks for doing that. We can go west to east maybe this time. So go ahead, Shannon. Uh, a particular example that came to mind when you said that was something that was coined within this region called the Unity Declaration. And this was a female chief from one of our communities who really wanted to bring the Coast Salish chiefs together to talk about how our traditional practices may be able to be adjusted or adapted during the times that we are finding ourselves in, which is a very, very complex uh, situation. I am a whole commitment woman. Uh, I, I attend ceremony in my community, uh, but I'm also within a colonial institution of, you know, a health authority and, and acting underneath a colonial act, the Public Health Act. And so it was a very kind of uh, gray, uh, complex world to find myself in. And in coming around a table with other people just having a conversation, one of our, one of our young female chiefs uh, was like, well, why don't we come together as chiefs? Because really, within First Nations territories on reserve or a lot of the longhouses where ceremony occurred are in a, in a gray area for jurisdiction as well. So it was really like working through conversations, not like legislation wasn't there as, as a tool in the same way. And uh, so this chief brought people together and she, she was a, a, a younger female chief. There's many, you know, older chiefs who are, have been around and had um, a longer uh, maybe uh, experience in the community, but she brought people around the table and we looked at like basically declaring, uh, uh, putting together a statement of how, of how communities, what, what the goals were in why maybe adjusting practices during the time of COVID would be in place and that everyone could collectively see those goals and then what might that look like when you enter a ceremony? And like that was not a conversation really that I felt I could have as a, as a medical health officer. I could be there around the table for it. But for, for that particular chief to bring that forward, to bring people around the table and not know, sorry, it's probably getting really nice, not know how, how that would be received, but to have the courage to say this we, we can change. I don't know what this looks like, but let's have that conversation and write some of these things down. And um, that then we did that the first winter ceremonial season. And then we looked at it in the second ceremonial winter season. And it created just this backdrop of familiarity that, you know, we weren't, we weren't creating all things new and that we had something to build upon given we were all exhausted and going into another winter season when we were dealing with the realities of the pandemic. Excellent, excellent story, uh, Shannon. Thank you for, um, for sharing that one. And you can see, you know, the, the, the conditions, if you will, or the, the factors that might influence that story of courage. And you know, writing it down, recording it, right? Reflecting back where we were and then how we move forward, um, taking the issue forward, gathering the people around, having those conversations, difficult conversations, not knowing what the outcome might be um, from that is, you know, all 
takes courageous leadership. And I'm going to say you minimized your role there a little bit, said, well, I couldn't have that. I could be here to do this. But I'm sure that uh, your presence in that situation was uh, uh, a big contributing factor. So thanks for sharing that story. Kathy? Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to, um, so I'm going to keep it at the individual level at this point and talk about the um, the acts of courage of, of individuals. And I think for me, the, the thing that stands out is that an act of courage doesn't have to be grand and heroic. Um, it's in the everyday actions that we, that we do and in uh, who we are as individuals and what we bring to work. Um, so I'm just going to use um, the actual words of nurses because I, I don't want to put words into their uh, into their mouths. But the first the first example is very early in the pandemic, and I, and I I don't want to forget this as we as we go forward. Um, um, that when we didn't know what we were dealing with, when we really didn't know anything about this virus, um, there was courage in just health professionals showing up to work. And I, and I think that's important that it, it people had to trust um, that they would um, uh, be protected, but they didn't know and they feared for their family, they feared that they might bring the virus home. And I think that's important to acknowledge that it took courage just to go to work in those very early days. Um, then, um, as we moved through the pandemic and we got into immunization clinics, and this is the one that I will put in um, into the words of, of uh, the nurse themselves, but this was a nurse working in a, uh, an immunization clinic that was one of the super sites that had been set up. And the uh, staff of the immunization clinics were not all nurses, so they were um, they were called immunizers. Um, so they were individuals that had been brought in and uh, and uh, provided some training. Um, and this nurse spoke out against uh, against what she felt was unsafe practice. So not applying protocols, not working to well-established public health immunization standards, and not willing to change practice, not adhering to policies, practices, or imperatives, such as the seven rights of the client being immunized, informed consent in general, and mature minor consent, not reviewing the pre-screening checklist, even more basic, not landmarking the belly of the deltoid and not using a 90 degree angle of insertion, applauded by leaders for productivity over proficiency and competing for coffee cards for the highest number of IMS per shift, safety sacrificed, client needs and rights are ignored and all my efforts of raising awareness and correcting practice were discounted and ignored. So there's someone who was practicing in a situation that they really felt um, uncomfortable with, but had the, uh, the courage to stand up. And then looking forward, um, I think the thing that was the most remarkable to me um, is that even in the thick of COVID, people are still looking forward to solutions and how to, how to move uh, into the next step. And so lots of um, courage and advocacy. So one way to address moral distress and health equities with client populations is by advocating strongly for what we need to make sure we as nurses can give the best care possible. We've known for a long time that our healthcare system and is failing uh, and people are getting overlooked. And I think the uh, COVID-19 amplified uh, both the problems within the system and the equities within society. And I think there's a strong uh, commitment um, and uh, it will require courage to move those conversations forward. So just sticking uh, at the individual level for my examples. Thanks, Kathy. And then uh, I'm going to go to you, uh, Gaynor. But uh, Greg has asked a question, and I'll ask you, Gaynor, just to give an example. But just as I'm doing that, maybe to think about, uh, he's asked a question that courage is needed to speak local truths, such as noting how public health measures negatively impacted vulnerable populations. So, for example, those that are uh, homeless, um, youth, families. And he's asking, what are your perspectives on when, why, and how is the right moment or approach to speaking out to decision makers about these impacts and how they should change their approach? 
And so, um, Gaynor, I'm going to ask you to answer the first question, and then if you want to sort of move on into that, because you were right smack dab in the middle of that as you were, um, as the pandemic unfolded. So over to you, Gaynor. Yeah, so um, I, there were so many examples of courage uh, that came up during the pandemic. It was hard for me to pin down even one. Uh, they're just, they're sort of so, um, ripe for me and, and colorful. But, but since leaving uh, my position as deputy chief and coming into this work at, at Dalhousie, I have had the opportunity to do some reflection on what are the combined set of leadership characteristics that we need to look at going forward that include courage, but I think also include some complementary um, pieces. And, and the reason I think that that's important work, and I think germane to this conversation, is that as I think about, you know, the next public health challenges that will come our way, which, as I said before, I, I'm, I'm convinced will be as complex, if not more complex than COVID-19 was. I'm aware that um, where we saw courage was in leaders who could embrace complexity. And in both the stories that I heard from Shannon and, and Catherine, I heard that in a sense of not knowing what the outcome is going to be from the outset, which is a big hallmark of complexity, but willing to take a step, any step, anyway, in, in service of um, hopefully better outcomes down the road. And so I, I would want to point to that. And I, you know, so I've been, I've been reviewing again um, with some delight some of the uh, literature on wicked problems, which was first um, described academically in the 1970s. And what I love about that is that, you know, the description includes things like, you know, the types of problems that, that um, generate complexity are those problems where um, even defining the problem is difficult because it's so complex, right? And um, if you apply a solution to the problem, the solution might have the intended outcome, and chances are it's going to generate two, three, five, seven unintended outcomes that you were not planning on, and you're going to have to course correct to deal with those, right? Um, and those complex problems involve necessarily clashes of values that have to be managed in the moment as you are trying to deal with the problem, however you were conceptualizing the problem, right? And so when I think about that, I think in addition to um, attributes of courage, we will also be need, need to be looking in our leadership uh, towards attributes of comfort with ambiguity, um, comfort with um, not having a comprehensive start, but starting somewhere and uh, being willing to follow it wherever it takes us, even if the path um, that it takes us on is not where we thought we were going to go, being willing to stick with it for the purpose of course correcting to get to the outcomes we're looking for. I don't know that those attributes are common. And so when I think about it, you know, those alongside of courage, I see a leadership kind of call to action that I think in public health, we're going to have to pay attention to um, going forward. So that, that's, that's my sort of answer to your first question, Claire. So it's, it's not, not a direct um, uh, example, but when I think about what the examples have taught me, I'm, I'm reminded that there are some things to pay attention to from, uh, from that literature on complexity and leadership for complexity. Um, in the question of, you know, kind of when is the right time to bring forward something, I, 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 don't, I don't know that there's ever a perfect time, and maybe that's my way of saying I'm not sure that there's a wrong time to bring it up, I, particularly if it represents, you know, harm to individuals. Um, and even if it represents self-betrayal, I think it, it, it needs to come forward. And there were certainly examples of that uh, in the pandemic where, you know, for example, we might institute something related to um, quarantine, as an example, in a group, using university students as an example. And, and uh, we had some fairly comprehensive quarantine arrangements for university uh, students at our something like 13 post-secondary institutions across the province of Nova Scotia. And those had unintended harms um, that needed to be brought to our attention. And they were, they were brought to our attention by the public. They were brought to the, our attention by the students and by the students' families and, uh, and in a number of different ways. And because the response itself was so public, 
it would have been, I think, unthinkable for us to not respond to those unintended harms in a similarly public way, right? And so maybe that was some of the benefit of what happened during COVID-19. So I don't know that there's a wrong time. Um, Shannon and Catherine may have a, a different take on it, but uh, I think when those things are happening, speaking, having the courage to speak is really important. Thanks, thanks, Gaynor. Um, I'm just going to add because there's a question in the in the chat box that sort of builds on Gaynor's answer there, and uh, the question is: I appreciate the comment at the outset about how public health will have to battle or discuss the notion that everyone is in public health um, and keeping true to science and standing in knowledge. And this person saying, I'm not in public health, but I'm in community development. And, and what they're asking is, how can others of us show courage and support to those public health efforts um, and looking for any direction? So I think, um, you know, Gaynor, your answer about timing and, and, you know, there not being a wrong time, but that this question is saying, so then how can others outside of public health or really maybe just alongside public health uh, able to support uh, the efforts um, on the way forward because I you talked about courage to defend our space in public health and the actions so I wondered uh, either Shannon or Catherine if you wanted to respond to that question so I can uh, maybe begin but um, so I think um, just to to follow up on uh, Gamer, Gainer's comment, I think absolutely um, that um, I think to speak up um, at the time um, that something is happening is important. And I think then to speak up afterwards when the media has moved on and um, public um, attention has moved away, um, it becomes even more important to continue to have those conversations and make sure um, that those issues um, stay on the policy agenda. And I think it's about um, us acting at all levels. I think uh, individual practitioners have some ability to practice within their roles and to advocate within their roles. But leaders have to um, really um, step forward and be able to critically look at what worked and what didn't work and, um, and be willing to acknowledge um, where we need to change. And I think at the policy level, we need um, political leaders that are committed um, to leadership for equity. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's very important. But we also need um, an informed electorate um, that will hold them accountable, that will do their due diligence and pay attention to who they're voting for and why, um, and, uh, and keep those conversations and those individuals um, supported when they bring these unpopular ideas forward to let them know that we, we do support uh, some of these things. Um, so I think those are those are all um, important points or uh, important time frames um, for those conversations. So oh, Claire, I think you're on mute. Sorry, we're gonna go, thanks. <laughs> So how many years have we been at this, right? And I still uh, forget to unmute the or mute it. Um, we're going to go into our small groups in a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to give Shannon uh, the last word in this part of our session. Then we're going to go into the small groups. Kathy and Gaynor are able to stay with us. We'll be in the small groups for about 20 minutes. That space is your space to talk about or think about or reflect on what you've heard or what you're thinking about. Then we'll come back to the plenary, to this larger group again for the last um, sort of eight or 10 minutes. Um, and one of the questions as I listen to all three of you speak is, um, you know, what gives you courage? What keeps you going? Shannon, you alluded to that in one of those ebbs, you know, how do I get up in the morning? What do I do in the morning? So if you want to just sort of answer that final question that we asked earlier, and then just some final words from you. And then we'll move into the small groups. So go ahead, Shannon. Sure, thanks. Um, so what gives me courage? I think, you know, what, what gives me energy and courage entering my work now is that, you know, it, it, there's constant changes in that 
really, I, that I, I feel that I have a, a place within that. I think really, uh, especially for some of the youth coming out of pandemic, you know, being disconnected from things like their, their peers and schools, how, how do we really, how do we really find, how do we rebuild that connection again? And um, for me, it, you know, I think what someone would just said, how do those alongside public health really help the efforts? Like really in, in my holistic, you know, view of the world, my holistic approach on my work, I think, you know, the comment I made when I was talking about the chief in the community and how, you know, it's really, it's not, it's not my place as a medical health officer to talk about ceremony, but really in being there in relationship with community over time, I'm invited to that table to give my input into how to, you know, answer some of these difficult questions, these, these wicked problems that we face. So in, in, I mean, I think my courage comes from in realizing that, you know, I come from a lineage of people that have answered difficult questions that have been through very difficult things and that I have a place and I don't need to do it all. I am with, you know, groups of people with other gifts and my, you know, my gift is, is critically important to that collective work moving forward. And if, when I, when I, when I can see that and tap into that, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, you know what, there's, there's important things that I, that I need to be part of today. And that, you know, some days I'll, I'll, I'll need to, you know, be off ill or, you know, recovering or something like that, but that I have a place along with others around the table to bring the work forward. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you for uh, bringing your authentic self to this conversation. So uh, we're going to let you go. Thank you very much for your contributions today. And I look forward to being in relation with you over time. So we're gonna move now into our small groups. Um, and as I said, Kathy and Gaynor are gonna come with us into some groups and we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes. Collect and share, and share and start to create a space for collective healing and recovery. And I'm just going to thank the group, the small group that I was in. Um, thanks for just really stepping up and sharing and, and contributing to that conversation. Um, it isn't how I think we have usually connected in, in webinars, if you will, where you've come, you're more likely to receive, not have this sort of conversational style. And of course, then into a small group where you know, with tough topics, complex topics um, being asked to, to share. So thanks for that. Our group conversation was outstanding and there was lots of evidence of um, uh, courageous leadership, uh, of advocacy, of um, moral uh, courage and, and stemming from moral uh, distress. So um, uh, thanks for, for embracing that opportunity. So I'm going to go back to Kathy and to Gaynor. Um, we have about uh, eight minutes here. Um, and I'm wondering if each of you could reflect on what you heard in, in the room that you were in. Kathy, you were with me. Uh, Gaynor, I think you were um, in, a, in a group discussion. So it doesn't matter who either one of you wants to start, just a few reflections. And then I'm going to ask the final question, which is what gives you courage? So don't answer that one right yet. So we'll give you two more times to, to speak. But what did you hear in that group um, uh, conversation? And what are some of your reflections on what you heard? Kathy, you've got your mic off. We'll go to you first. Thank you. Yes, the conversation was wonderful to hear. And I think I can't be in a room with professionals uh, at any point in this um, uh, in this pandemic without learning and, uh, and gaining strength from the conversation. So thank you for that. I think the thing that struck me um, is something certainly that I have experienced and heard myself throughout, and that's that through the pandemic, we've been exposed to a conflict, our values have been challenged, um, and we have seen things we truly value, um, equity and um, the amplification of inequity. And that can either defeat us or it can move us forward. And what I heard from the conversation in our small group was the courage for people to use that 
we want to call it anger, frustration, distress um, into positive action for change going forward. And that's not easy, but uh, but I heard commitment to that, certainly. Yeah, and like I said, I was in the same group as you and and being strategic about that, right? So, you know, speaking up and speaking out, but also ensuring that um, you're going to get the most um, effectiveness from lifting your voice and so being heard and being strategic about that which takes uh reflection as well as courage gainer what did what did you hear in that small group yeah a little bit similar in that you know i think where we started as a group was around this question around um you know how do we find the courage to challenge even how our systems are already deeply structured for oppression and betrayal of those values and so how do we challenge power? How do we resist the urge to sort of snap back? And so you certainly myself, as I was listening, I was initially in this place of we need that kind of savvy, smart, compelling, relentless energy to sort of uh, drive those changes. But the conversation also sort of touched on how do we gain the energy to imagine and to reimagine and where we may go next? And how do we battle the fatigue that we're all feeling now in order to get to that next energetic place? How do, we how do we fend off those who might take advantage of us at this point where we are uh, potentially seen as vulnerable, certainly um, by, by political masters, for example. And so it certainly reminded me that, um, I, you know, I think one of the, the ingredients to our recovery will need to be our intentional and deliberate creation of space. Um, spaces like this that the NCC has created. And so thank you um, again to the NCCDH for, uh, for this series, but also space in our individual uh, home lives and you know, kind of work-life ba work balance uh, sort of lives to be able to um, do that recovery, but also deliberate creative space in our work lives because it's our creativity, it's our brains as professionals that we're paid for. And it's that um, attention to creating the creative space for us that might be the thing that helps us uh, sort of uh, live and breathe our courage going forward. And what was interesting about that is, I think we had some recognition that um, by, of all of the sort of branches of healthcare that you can imagine, public health necessarily has to be one of the most creative, which, you know, it, there's very little creativity, I said to the group, that you can sort of bring into an ICU. The things that need to happen in ICU just kind of need to happen. In public health, we have the benefit of working with communities and some sort of prolonged timelines around that. And so our creativity is a big part of what we bring. It's a big asset we need to bring. We need to be intentional about cultivating that at an organizational level. And so that was kind of where we left the conversation was this aha moment that um, creative space might be our secret weapon going forward. I really like that. And one of the, um, Greg actually in our group talked about sort of this notion of black and white and things being black and white, but where he sees color and sees that color in the community and, and needs to, to speak to that. So final question and Gaynor, I'll start with you and then to you, Kathy, what gives you courage, Gaynor? Well, it's, it's funny you should start there because uh, for me, taking space is a big part of what uh, brings courage back into my life. So, you know, being surrounded by folks that I can work with and who see the same problems and are as dedicated to, the, you know, sort of the same creative solutions. But also for me, having that creative space in my work week to just do that imagining, um, you know, what my partner describes is that when he sees me do that, I, I come out swinging. I, I come out ready to productively disrupt the system in the next uh, volley. And so that's, that's become a really important practice for me. And so that, that's a big part of how I, I continue to generate courage. Thanks for that answer. And I love that word disruption. We are also really thinking a lot about disruptors and <laughs> disruption. And uh, I love that you made the connection between courage, creativity, and disruption. So. Gainer, we love you. We love what you do and what you stand for. And so thanks for being here with us again today. Kathy, what gives you courage? 
Yeah, well, lots of things, I think, but uh, I think the, the first thing is remembering um, that, uh, thankfully, I'm only one drop in the bucket. And although that doesn't make a big difference to how full the bucket is, um, the positive forces and voices of everybody around me will eventually fill that bucket. Um, so I think that's one thing. Um, I think it's also remembering that acts of courage don't need to be grand. They can be everyday acts and they can be, it's important in terms of what we bring to every table that we're at and every conversation that, we are, the, um, that we're at. Um, so not having to take on the responsibility of fixing, but just being part of, um, part of that solution moving forward. And I think finally, um, making sure um, continually engage in reflective practice. So I love to walk and to do it every day. And that's when I reflect on things, put things in perspective. Um, this is going to take perseverance. Um, we're in this for the long haul. Um, so we need to, to sort of look at how we, we maintain that voice going forward um, for, the, for the months and next crisis. Um, so those would be things. Thanks, Kathy. And as I said in the introduction, I've known uh, both of you for a long time. And Kathy, you, you live that reflection and, and you exude it. You can feel it when you're in the room, when you're in the front of the room or around a table. So uh, uh, keep, keep with that. I'm going to close the session today um, and thank everybody for being here with us in our uh, third conversation series and our fourth conversation. Please consider coming back. June 22nd is our final one, and we're going to talk about hope. Um, before I came here, I was uh, listening to the keynote, um, and Dr. Becky Palmer was speaking as the keynote opening the Community Health Nurses of Canada conference that's going on right now virtually. And she asked a question that I'm going to leave you with. And um, it, she asked the audience to consider what keeps you well in this work? So I'm going to leave you with that. Thanks, Gaynor and Kathy. You both alluded to what keeps you well in this work. Um, and I'd like everybody who's still here with us, there's 28 of you still in the room, to consider and to reflect on what keeps you well in, the, in this work, because I think that's what will contribute to your courage and your courageful action on the way forward. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Thanks to the team. And we'll see you on the 22nd. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye, Gaynor. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, bye, Kathy. It was excellent. Thanks for your contribution. Nice job, Claire. Thank you. We'll just stay here for a minute. And uh, Diane, if you want to stay, Hannah. The others are good. It's all us now. That's okay. Good. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Lori and Michelle.